morning. The reading today is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Lord God, we thank you for your word and the incredible encouragement we find within. We pray right now that you'd give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hands and feet to be quick to obey what you have for us, and hearts to take it in. Holy Spirit, would you transform us to make us love Jesus more and more, we pray. Amen. Before we dig into the passage, I just want to say uh, greetings from Outlook Church up in Toowoomba. Um, they wanted me to pass on the thanks that uh, you let me go and preach for them. Um, so it was, a, it was really nice to experience a, a different church and to be able to uh, bless them as they pass us and leave. So greetings from them. Uh, the other thing is that I'll be away again next week. I'll be down in Canberra for a big nerd tournament. Um, so if you want to um, catch up with one of the classes over the weekend, it's just John this weekend. So Byron back on Sunday, I think, or Monday. So just John over this weekend, but during the week I'll be here. Um, Psalm 130. It's interesting, I think, that uh, John chose this psalm a, a while ago, before we knew Jack was ill, but there's so much here that seems to apply to that situation as well as uh, what many of us have been going through. I think it's been a rough couple of years for a lot of people. And we can certainly read Psalm 130 when it talks about the depths in that regard to the depths of our personal things, but I think it's a, a, a little deeper than just if I'm in a tough situation. So let's explore this a bit and, and see the riches of this passage. Verse 1 and verse 2 starts with, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Out of the depths I cry. This is a, a, a raw, emotional thing that the psalmist is bringing. This is a heart cry that something is seriously wrong. Something is seriously wrong. This isn't your everyday, oh, you know, stub my toe, so I'm a little bit upset. This isn't, I have a bad day at work sort of cry. This is a, there is something seriously wrong in my life. There is something that has just absolutely crushed me, and I feel like I'm in the depths. Right? The word depths in, in the Old Testament in particular is often used to refer to the deep deeps of the ocean. So you can sort of see the imagery that the psalmist is trying to bring. You know, the depths of the ocean where it's just total blackness, where you feel like you're being crushed by the pressure. Now, the Hebrews probably didn't understand that terribly well because they didn't like venturing on the sea much. But these days, we can understand even richer that once you hit a certain depth, it's all dark. There's nothing there. The pressure will literally crush you to death. And there seems to be no hope if you start sinking. That's one of my biggest fears is being stuck out in the ocean and not knowing how deep the bottom is. Uh, I like to be able to be close enough where I can put my feet down. Uh, don't mind going out as long as I can get back. But the psalmist here is saying, I am in the depths and I'm not just floating, I'm not treading water, I am sinking. And it is terrifying and I have no hope, no ability to save myself. I've got no energy, I've got nothing left. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. The psalmist recognises that there is only one response to do. His strength is to feed it. His ability to save himself, there's nothing to cling to. So the only thing they can do is cry out to God. Cry out to the Lord. It's a desperate cry. A panicked cry. A drowning cry. And repeats that in verse 2. Sorry, in, out of the depths I cry to you, I cry to you, O Lord. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the pleas for my mercy. 
I cry to you, O Lord, and O Lord, hear my voice. Do you hear the desperation? Repeating the same lines, just absolutely struggling here. I wonder if that's something that you can associate with. That absolute struggle of, I just feel like I'm completely over my head. The psalmist has been there. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Notice there's a repetition going on in this verse. Cry, voice, please. Right? It's, the, the, the psalmist is not idle in their thinking. They know that there is hope. Not in themselves though. There is something that can save them. Something that can transform this situation. But it's not them. It has to be God. So the first thing we see in this passage is while the, they're struggling and sinking, there is also the sovereignty of God that can be absolutely relied on. The psalmist says there is only one person who can save me and that is God. Why else would they cry out to God if they didn't think he could save? Hear my pleas for mercy. This danger needs to be resolved. These pleas for mercy sort of changes the, the feel a little bit of this passage, right? Because at first it's, I'm sinking, but when you start saying, but this is about mercy, that tells us that maybe the reason the psalmist is sinking is because it's something that they've done, something about them. This isn't an accident that they're sinking in the depths. This is something intrinsic to who they are. Hear my pleas for mercy. There's an acknowledgement here that God can save, but the psalmist doesn't deserve to be saved, right? If, if the psalmist said, said, hear my pleas for justice, I don't deserve to be in the ocean, that'd be a different thing. But the psalmist says, no, no, have mercy on me. I don't deserve this. Only you can save. Again, there's this very high view of God in just two verses, right? That God alone can save, but we can do nothing. And I think that is absolutely where we need to start when we come to these sort of passages. When we come to seasons in life that are tough and hard, we need to acknowledge that God is the only one. We can't get through it in our own strength. We can try. We'll come out much more damaged. God is the one who is sovereign. He is over all. And he is the only one who is able to save. And we don't deserve it. So we've got a bit of a problem here. The psalmist is crying out to a God who is able to save, but may not save. Verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand iniquities or sin? And the word there for mark is the same word that's used later talking about watching. Saying, God, if you would stare at me, and if you would cut me to the quick and strip away all my pretenses, and you could see exactly who I was and everything that I've done wrong, which God does do. And if you held me to account for them, who could stand? I couldn't stand say, I'm a righteous person. I couldn't stand saying I'm a good person. I would fall under the weight of your judgment. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? And now we see what the root of the psalmist's problem is. The root of the psalmist's problem is they're a sinner. They've fallen short of the perfect standard of God. And that has crushed them to realize that I am a sinner. To realize that I thought life was going well and things were okay, but actually there is something very, very wrong with me. It's not a misstep that landed them in the deep. It is sin. What conviction. Right? To, to, to be able to cry out like the psalmist, Lord, I, sin is so serious to me. It is so weighing down on me that all I can do is cry out and plead for mercy. It, it can be easy, I think, particularly as, as Christians, to sort of brush off sin as if it's not a big deal. You know, because we know there is forgiveness in Jesus. So we go, okay, you know, I've sinned, sorry God. And we sort of brush it away as if it's nothing. But the conviction of the psalmist is that this is something serious, this is something heavy, something that changes my life. But with you, there is forgiveness. Verse 4, but with you, there is forgiveness. I love that. I love that. It's, I've said this a number of times when I've preached. When I see but in scripture, it normally means something good. <laughs> like it's going in one direction of I am sinking, I am in trouble, I deserve judgment, I deserve this. Have mercy, please. 
and I couldn't stand if you did judge me, but <coughs> with you there is forgiveness. Right? He's revealing the character of God. This is God who doesn't need to save. This is God who doesn't need to have mercy. This is God who is just and should punish, but with you is forgiveness. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. See, God's character is not that of a tyrant. He's not of someone who's got to stick to the rules so hard, though he is, that he's going to crush us for it, that it's completely black and white, although he is, that we're going to suffer for it because there is forgiveness. He doesn't take pleasure in harsh judgments. His character is forgiveness. That's what it means when it says, with you is forgiveness. Forgiveness is by your side always. Forgiveness is part of your character, God. So we're going to run into a bit of trouble. How can he be a just God who could punish everyone? Who we deserve those iniquities, each and every one of us, who can't stand before his glory, but with him is forgiveness. And we'll solve that problem in a second. You know, I think when people read the Old Testament, you tend to get this impression that the God of the Old Testament, all, especially in the world around us, right, in our culture, that God is this God of fire and judgment and, and smiting and strict rules, and then Jesus is, is this nice guy. He's different. God of the Old Testament mean nasty and judgy. Jesus of the New Testament, well, he's a nice guy, and we can kind of accept him, but we don't like the Old Testament God. But that's not what the psalmist experiences. The psalmist says, no, actually with you is forgiveness. Your character is forgiveness. I think these, this passage is very much like Romans 3, verses 23 and 24, isn't it? It's very much New Testament language. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of, that is in Christ Jesus through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So you see the same thing here, right? If you would mark iniquities, who could stand but with you is forgiveness? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but there is redemption in Jesus, right? It's, it's not a new thing, right? God's story is the same through the Old Testament to the New, New Testament. He doesn't suddenly change his mind when he decides to send Jesus. Right? His character has been and always will be forgiveness. When we reach rock bottom, like the psalmist, when we feel like everything is crushing and that sin is sinking us into oblivion, when we can no longer do anything to save ourselves and we recognize that all the religious stuff, like coming to church, like doing the right thing, like following the rules, when we realize all of that cannot save us and we cry out, hear my pleas for mercy, God. And we cry out, Lord Jesus, you died on the cross for my sin. Would you save me? And my life is dead. Would I have your life? Would you help me to live your way? Right? It, it's as simple as that. Old Testament, New Testament, it's the same story. God loves to forgive. That is his character. In you is forgiveness. That you may be feared. Hmm. It's a little bit awkward. The, the, this verse has caused a lot of people to stumble. In scripture because they go, well, what's fear got to do with that? I mean, particularly when you think of 1 John 1, 4, verse 18, which talks about perfect love drives out fear. But here it's saying, but because there's forgiveness, you will be feared, God. Now, I, when I read this fear, it's, it's not a terror sort of thing. This is a respect, right? It's the, because you are full of forgiveness, you will be feared. In other words, God suddenly becomes my highest priority. I no longer fear the things that cause me to sin. Now you might think, well, I don't fear a lot of things that cause me to sin. But actually, that's where it's at. You respect them more than you respect God. You see them as having a higher influence in your life than God has an influence in your life. Right? So maybe it's lust. The fear is, well, I'm going to miss out on this unless I solve this now. Same with greed. I want this thing now. And I want more of it for myself because I am going to miss out if I don't have it. Same with anger and violence and then taking things at a time that it's not right for you to take, right? All of those sins come out of the fact that I fear myself or I fear people around me. I lash out because I fear how people are going to react. I say things to fit in with the crowd because I fear what people are going to say about me, right? 
But with God, when we begin to fear the one who doesn't treat us the way we deserve to be treated, but treats us with forgiveness, that's a totally different story. When we understand that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that Jesus is that perfect example of what it means to be obedient to Father, that, that's totally different to being afraid. That's a, a respectful fear. That's an understanding of who God is. You know, this is very much a, a New Testament concept here in the Old Testament. And I think it's like regeneration. You know, we're being transformed into the image of Christ. That's the New Testament language that we get. And here it talks about that God may be feared. He rescues us so that we would be more like him, so that he would be our first priority, so we would live like him. It's the same sort of thing we see with Jesus in the New Testament. If, if I fear God, this is the sort of God who I fear, the one who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It's Romans 8.32. Right, that's what it means to fear God. It means to know that he gave his son instead of punishing us. And on top of that, he will give us all things. That's what it means to fear God. It doesn't mean to, to tremble and be afraid and terrified that if I do something wrong, he's going to smite me. No, that's not it at all. It's this heart that says, I trust you and I love you. I'm going to worship you because of who you are and what you've done in my life. Because Holy Spirit transforms us to understand that. And so the psalmist in verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. The psalmist waits. The psalmist knows God can save and that God's character is forgiveness, so they wait for forgiveness. For us, we don't need to wait. Right? We don't need to wait to head up to the temple to offer the sacrifice like they did in the Old Testament. The sacrifice has been made through Jesus once and for all. But what I think how we can apply this way is sometimes when we ask God for forgiveness, we don't wait to actually receive it, even though it's been given. Right? And what I mean is... I don't know whether this rings true for any of you guys, but it rings true for me. Sometimes I'll be praying and say, Lord, forgive me because I did this yesterday or this morning. And then a little bit later on in the day, you're like, oh, God, please forgive me for that same thing that you've already prayed about. Right? And then maybe a little bit later, five minutes later, it comes back into your prayer again. Lord, please forgive me. And God's already forgiven us. right? He already knows. We don't need to keep repeating the same thing over again as if he hasn't hurt us. But what we do need to do is wait and realize that forgiveness is already ours in Christ Jesus. To stop a moment, instead of panicking, that I need to ask again and again and again and go, well, hang on. No, it's already been applied by the blood of Jesus to my life. So I wait for the Lord. I wait to receive it. And how does he do that? He says, in his word, I hope. This isn't an idle waiting of, I'm going to wait and see what happens. This is, a, I'm going to remind myself that I am forgiven. I'm going to remind myself that the character of God is forgiveness, that it is love. Right? And how do I do that? In His Word. Right? Your Bibles are so valuable to your life. So valuable. There is so much hope in there. There is so much that it reveals about the character of God. The more we understand about the character of God, and we've got all eternity to learn it, but the more we understand about the character of God, the, the better everything becomes. Maybe not physically, but eternally, the better everything becomes. The psalmist repeats. So verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. Verse 6, again, my soul waits for the Lord. More than the watchman for the morning. More than the watchman for the morning. This is the image of like um, a... I was thinking during this week, how, how do we get this same sort of image? Because it's very different. Because back in the day, you'd have watchmen on the walls of your city. And they'd be there taking different shifts overnight and waiting to see if an enemy were going to try and do a sneak attack. And it was your job. You had to be alert. You had to be on the lookout to make sure that your city wasn't going to get wiped out. And obviously, come morning, you don't need to be as observant, right? Generally, a night watchman is replaced by a day watchman. So you're waiting for your shift, you're waiting for all the darkness to disappear, to be able to at least see clearly where the enemy are. And that relief that dawn is coming, that's the same sort of 
image that the psalmist is giving here. I wait eagerly, I wait expectingly, and also for that relief that comes of knowing that God is going to bring forgiveness, that he has brought forgiveness, but also knowing as you wait for the dawn, new dawn always rises. Right? It's going to come. It is inevitable. Right? And that's the beauty of this. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. Right? God is my only hope. He's my only strength. And I wait for him. I want to experience him. I want to be in his presence. Even though I'm a sinner, even though I don't deserve it, I want him and I will wait for him. So instead of trying to rush ahead and solve things my way, I will wait for the Lord. More than watchmen, eagerly wait for the sun to rise and for their shift to be re- replaced. Verse 7. So, O Israel, hope in the Lord. The psalmist goes from this deep cry, this heartfelt plea to God, save me, to suddenly, well, God has forgiven me, so they start preaching. O Israel, hope in the Lord. This is no longer me and God language. This is me to you language. So forgiveness has come for the psalmist. Turns from pleas to preaching. And our gospel message, as we share with people, should come out of the same place. Right? It's all well and good if we can share to friends and family about Jesus. But if we're able to share out of the fact that we understand that I myself am a sinner and I don't deserve it we're able to share out of the depths of who God raised me up from, that is a much more powerful witness than just stating the truth of Scripture that Jesus came into the world to save sinners, which is true. But the psalmist here wants to preach, wants to proclaim, wants to share because they understand who they were and now who they are in God. That's where our gospel proclamation should come as well, when we're sharing with someone on the bus when you're talking with your friends and family who don't know Jesus, when you're talking with a colleague and sharing with them, uh, it's not some abstract concept that forgiveness can be found. This is a personal thing. No, I understand forgiveness because I was in the depths. I understood that I deserve the judgments of God. But He is a forgiving God. He is a loving God. And He loved us so much that He sent His Son to die for us. That's the core of the gospel presentation. It's it's no mistake that the Great Commission comes after Jesus' death and resurrection, right? When the disciples begin to understand and apply, this is what Jesus has done. He doesn't say before then, go out and tell everyone. It's after they begin to understand and not fully until the Holy Spirit convicts them at Pentecost that the penny really drops. Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. Two more revelation of God's character here. With the Lord, we saw earlier, is forgiveness. That's his character. With the Lord is steadfast love. Unfailing love. His forgiveness comes not out of a sense of duty, but out of a sense of love. And love that never lets us go. Love that although we disappoint him time and time again, he never abandons us. Love that even though we fall short, never forgets us. Love, although we hurt God, never leaves us or forsakes us. That's the promise that Jesus gives us until the very end of the age. With God, there is steadfast, unwavering, faithful love. Love that is with us through all our mess. And we are messy. Let's be honest. Our lives are messy. Our relationships are messy. Everything is messy. And God still loves us. Right? Incredible. Unfailingly. Faithfully. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The second thing we see in that last part of the character of God is plentiful redemption. Right, this isn't a, a one and done deal. This isn't a, I came, I sinned and it was terrible and I recognized and God saved me and then I sin again and oh, I've got to go through the whole process again. Or I've made my mistakes and I'm down in the bottom again and God's going to leave me. Um, there is 
plentiful redemption again and again and again. I come in repentance and recognize my sin before the Lord, knowing that I am saved in Jesus, but admitting that I have done wrong and knowing, knowing that I am His. Colossians 3 speaks very clearly of that, that we have already died, right? And our life is hidden with Christ and it will be revealed when he returns. That language in Colossians 3 is very much, you have died and you will appear with Christ in his return. It's the surety, the surety of plentiful redemption. His love never runs out. His forgiveness never stops. His redemption, that is, his transforming us To be more like him, to be more like Jesus, never ceases. He who began a good work in you will give up after you make too many mistakes. No, he who began a good work in you will carry it on until completion. That's how the passage goes. Jesus, when he was asked, how many times should I forgive my brother? One or two times, three or four times, seven times? And Jesus has not seven, 70 times seven. Perfection, unlimited, keep forgiving. Why? Because that is how God forgives us. When we come with an honest, broken heart, the Psalm 51 talks about it. Right? When we come with a broken heart and say, God, I, I realize I have fallen way short, but in you is plentiful forgiveness. In you is steadfast love. In you is plentiful redemption. So the Psalms confidently in verse 8 says, And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Not some of them, all of them. There is nothing that you can do that is so vile, so terrible, that God cannot forgive you. If there is something that you're holding in your heart that you don't want to give over to Jesus because you think he can't handle this, he can't handle the darkness, whatever that is. No. The promise we have here, he will forgive Israel, he will forgive the new people of God, all their iniquities, all their sins. So give it over to Jesus. That's what we sang previously in that last song. I'll stop all negotiations with the God of all creation. It's acknowledging the height of who God is and saying, I'm not going to try and bargain with God. I'll give you part of my life, I'll give you part of my sin, and I'll try and hold on to the rest. I'm not saying, I'll just give it all to you, God, because... I'm a mess and I can't handle it myself. I need you to transform me. So church, the challenge for us this morning is to allow ourselves to be cut to the core by our sin. To allow Holy Spirit to prompt us that when we sin, it is serious business. And particularly for those who have not come to the knowledge of who Jesus is. Right? To allow that to happen. And if we're sitting where we're starting to become callous and you recognize sin in your life that you haven't dealt with, that you haven't brought before Jesus, to recognize and say, God, please afflict me like the psalmist, that I would lean on you, not so that you could crush me and make me feel like I'm a nobody, but because with you is forgiveness. Right? We can't receive forgiveness unless we acknowledge that we need forgiveness first. We can't heal unless the process begins. You know, the word forgiveness in this passage, in the Hebrew, means cutting off. Right? It's the idea of a surgeon cutting off, cutting out gangrene or cutting out cancer so the rest of the body can heal. It doesn't happen until we ask the good doctor, Jesus, to come and heal us. So allow ourselves to be cut to the core. Recognize it's serious, but at the same time, not to despair. Because the power of what Jesus did on the cross perfectly reveals that with God there is forgiveness, that with God there is steadfast love, and with God there is plentiful redemption. So let's let that change our lives, that we, like the psalmist, will eagerly be able to tell others around us the character of our mighty God who would save a wretch like me. And I think... Honestly, that to that, Jack would resoundingly said, Hallelujah, Sovereign Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that your character is unchanging. Lord, you've been love from the start. You've been forgiveness from the start. 
Lord, that you are forgiveness means you knew what we would do all along. You know our character. You know us when you knitted us together in our mother's wombs. And Lord, we thank you so much that when we turn to you, there is plentiful redemption. There is forgiveness and unfailing love. So God, I pray this morning, if there's anyone here this morning who does not know you, who has not experienced your love, Holy Spirit, would you be doing your convicting work to bring us to repentance? If there's anyone here this morning who has just become numb to you, would you bring us to repentance? Bring us before the foot of the cross of Jesus that we would ask your forgiveness and receive your forgiveness. Receive your unfailing love and be restored and regenerated and made more and more like Jesus. Lord, as you work in us by the power of your Spirit, transform us, we pray. Give us a heart that loves what you've done on the cross, that loves what you've done in our life, that we would go out and, like the psalmist, preach to those around us. Preach in our words, preach in our actions, preach in the way that we love and support and get alongside each other. Lord, by your Spirit, drive us out and may the name of Jesus be glorified because of what you've done.